This is a great section to have a look at. So on my right side, you've got very, very narrow channels and a series of islands. All right, so Zambezi River typically is quite wide and difficult to cross. Hippos, crocodiles, all sorts of things lurking in there. But where you've got these series of islands, people can come from the far side and they can hop, skip and jump over here. It's very easy to cover your tracks, have a little boat in each little streamline. And when you've got your animal, you just pop it into one boat, you float it down, you get it off onto the next side and you can very quickly re remove wildlife. And it's very, very difficult to track. And you, know, you can imagine a whole buffalo goes on a boat, it comes down 300 meters, and now you've got to move back in, in um, a northerly direction. Very difficult to track like that and pick up where the guy's actually crossing. So it's ideal. And for that reason, this section of Zambezi River is targeted a lot because of the ease of access. Here, uh, from where my position is, we're on Zimbabwean mainland. We've got about another 800 meters to the Zambian Zimbabwe border. There's no, there's no points there, there's no white stone markers, there's no fence, there's nothing. And uh, these islands are, are hotly contested or disputed by both governments. Uh, there are Surveyor General's maps and we do know where the boundary, the official boundary is, but governments still fight. And so even clashing with poachers on here is a difficult thing. This here is a Zambezi cocoa bean. It's a very, very good wood to make axes and uh, implements. So uh, things like um, budzes or hoes, uh, implements that you use in farming. So the guys come in there, will chop these trees down. This is very common to see this along the Zambezi River. They'll come in there, chop those trees, and then fashion them into, into axe handles and pick handles. And, um, and obviously with axes and things like that, that is a, one of the tools that a lot of poachers need. When they're in the bush, they carry an axe. Many, uh, much of the time, more so an axe than a, than a rifle. So this is where they get the raw product from, right here on the Zambezi River line. So on this particular one here, we've got a single strand wire. Uh, you can see here where this, previously there was one before, there are two single strand wires here. These particular snares would be used to catch maybe a bushbuck, a kudu, something on those lines, but single strand, not, not very heavy. Um, but it could, it could certainly carry one of those animals for a long time. So we want to remove these two. But interesting to see how the guys have put this fence. They put some, some sticks here, which means that the animals actually go through into, into their snare as opposed to being able to come through and avoid them. So interesting to see the change in tactic on this particular section. So with these snares, each, each snare has got its own unique calling card. Some snares have got one loop. This particular snare has got one strand. Uh, this snare that we picked up a little bit earlier is hoist cable. It's got two little loops on there, if you look at that there. Okay, so this is a signature, basically. And you've got two different individuals laying these snares in this particular area. So if this particular snare catches an animal, obviously I now know who can take that, or who can take the meat, who, who it belongs to. This one here, I would suggest that this is probably a youngster, uh, probably a, a chap in his teens. Uh, he's learning how to lay traps and snares, and um, he doesn't want to waste his valuable product. So what he's doing, he's laying one at a time, one at a time, one at a time, to learn the art of poaching, mm -hmm. and how it must be tied, how it must be secured, where it must be tied and secured. Um, and if one of these strands breaks, well, okay, it's an expensive uh, life lesson, but at least I haven't lost my biggest snare, which I'm going to be using for buffalo later on when, I've, when I'm well versed. It's not uncommon to come through this particular area and remove 20 or 30 snares in the morning. And one of the things that I really enjoy doing um, is, you know, when we're doing walking safaris through here, is actually to engage with the guests. Mm. Part of the experience is understanding what the problems are. So you walk through here with guests and you'll say to them, have you ever done anti-poaching? And they say, no, we haven't. And so it's a new activity. You bring them out here and you explain what poaching is all about. The subsistence element to it, the necessity for people to eat. And then they get up and they get personal and they see this stuff and they see how difficult it is to spot. And then they, um, they feel part of the conservation effort. Yeah. And they too help. And you know, often they're not as versed, well versed as us and they get tired very quickly. But at least they are understanding better the issues that face Africa today. Now the plants we use there, tied up. And grass on the other side. Grass there. Stick up here brand new again, hey? Very new. Last couple of nights. Can you match it up against those others? Does it look like a similar pattern? Different, uh, different cable, and I think a different tie-off altogether. There are there are a double knot here, but you'll see that they're very, very close together. Whereas this one here is a little bit further apart. Yeah. So I would say that this could actually be the son of 
or something along those lines, someone who is learning, but um, I think altogether it's probably a different person. So often what happens here with these hoist cables is you'll find that there will be a, a syndicate running and you'll have uh, a friendly, if I can call him that, in one of the mines and he will then take cable, the steel cable, and he'll have his home village down here somewhere. And what will happen is um, the cable will come in, the person in the village will take receipt of that cable and then will promise bush meat. And after a month or two, perhaps six months, then that bush meat will then be delivered to the man, the friendly, in the, um, in the mine. And so there is a syndicate running, it is a bit of a barter trade, but what we're we doing, we're disrupting this whole pattern. So now the, the person in the village is now going to find an alternative method of repaying. And um, you know, it can get a little bit nasty from time to time. There will be fighting within the villages because one's lost the ability to catch or to, to poach. So uh, we just do as much disruption as we possibly can. It's not always about uh, catching the poacher, but the disruption is equally good. This, what we've, our stash from this afternoon, this will probably disrupt three or four poachers for the next three or four months, which is ideal. It's exactly what we're trying to achieve. It's all very good. So we've probably got about, I would say this is about 15, 18 kilos worth of, of wire that we've pulled out this afternoon. Um, we've established there's probably about three or four guys that have put this wire down and we, we you know we, we're having a look at all the little signatures on each individual snare so about four guys that are doing this but I think it, you know really it really shows how desperate many of the community players are they need food and so they've come in here they've laid the the river line full of these snares and um, you know we've probably saved this particular area in the region of 20 or 30 thousand US dollars just in one afternoon by collecting these snares probably a little bit more so it just, yeah, I think it just goes to show how desperate the guys really are. Yeah. It's interesting also, this is what we've picked up in an hour and a half between three guys. Um, what haven't we seen that's still out there? Absolutely. Um, that's, uh, that's the scary part. Um, you know, if we had a, the resources to put 10, 12 people through here in a sweep line, we probably would have picked up quite a lot more yeah you know we've been fairly thorough in this very small area but we've got 40 kilometers worth of river line here which is all exposed to this problem of poaching from across the water we need more boots on the ground we need more foot patrols more regularly we're not catching poachers but what we're doing is we're disrupting the activity yeah, frustrating them yeah. frustrating all of their their things okay and yes we're just coming out of a full moon at the moment the the poachers moon so we would expect to find more but during the course of the month there are more snares being laid more and more so as we clean up this area and we go to different areas there's more snares being put down here and it's just an ongoing battle and typically our challenge is from now onwards through the dry season during the wet season when the river is very high it's more difficult for them to cross over and come and poach being the first sort of sweep we've done this dry season it'll get worse it's it's going to increase as the season gets drier the water gets lower the game start coming down to the river to drink and they sit on the other side and they watch they watch where the buffalo are coming down they come across set the snares and go back and wait very difficult to catch them they're here for a few hours at the most and then they're gone yeah, and as you pointed out further back in there, there was evidence of stomach contents that had obviously been taken out yeah. when they cut the buffalo up. Yeah, I we think must have found four or five of I those. I think, yes, I think you're right there, Guy. We found at least five places where buffalo have been gutted and stomach contents have been entered, emptied here this afternoon in, in our one and a half hours. Yeah. You know, how many have we missed? Jeez. Uh, you know, um, and that's, that's the big issue. People, manpower, boots on the ground, 